Good evening and welcome to another presentation of the APIs and Government Programme, where we give you the latest on government's plans, programs, policies and projects. I am Bavin Oliver. Coming up, several policemen and women recognized for their hard work at an award ceremony. Diabetics give an advice on how to care for their feet. Some light was shed on the work public health officers put in to look for mosquitoes in the natural environment. These and other stories coming up, but first, we have News Watch with Yinka Goodluck. Good evening. This is News Watch and I am Yinka Goodluck. A team from the Seismic Research Unit of the UWI is currently here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to assess the state of La Soufre. The volcano is currently undergoing an effusive eruption. During this stage, lava steadily flows out of the volcano onto the ground. The team of scientists is being led by Vincentian volcanologist Professor Richard Robinson and arrived via Regional Security Services aircraft. The scientists did a flyover La Soufre earlier today to get a first-hand view of the activities. The alert level remains at orange and all communities fancy to Georgetown and Belle Isle to Richmond are asked to be on alert and listen to all advisories from the National Emergency Management Organization. The National Emergency Response System has already been activated in the event of a violent explosion. The National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, through the Seismic Research Unit and the University of the West Indies, has been conducting a volcano-ready project since 2017 in vulnerable communities throughout the country, with emphasis on disaster response and readiness. Amidst the many challenges of the year 2020 and the struggles of the nurses on the front line, Correa's Distribution Limited and Campari gave them a reason to smile. This, as 738 nurses were each presented with a $50 voucher amounting to $37,000 EC dollars. Chief Nursing Officer Peggy De Silva said that when 2020 was declared the International Year of the Nurses, this unpredictable pandemic was not envisioned. De Silva went on to state that nurses have risen and accepted the challenges presented without fear. The Ministry of Health has said that contact tracing is a key strategy for preventing the spread of COVID-19 or any other infectious disease. It requires immediate and swift actions. This, as the number of COVID-19 cases have risen and the recent cases have no history of recent travel. Hence, new protocols have been introduced for mass gatherings, including outdoor gatherings with or without amplified music that should have a maximum of 400 persons. Thank you for viewing Newswatch. I am Yinka Goodluck. The API's Eye on Government continues with Bavin Oliver. The spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrists. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness 
at the environment. Welcome back. You're watching the APIs and government. The Royal St. Vincent and Grenadines Police Force on Tuesday evening honored retirees and outstanding officers. The APIs Yinka Goodluck tells us more. A catalyst to success is hard work, discipline, and dedication. This was the theme at the celebration of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force Awards ceremony. Police officers, staff, and volunteers were rewarded for their courage, dedication, and service to the public. More than 100 guests attended the event at the Russell's Auditorium on Tuesday evening, which saw recipients from across the force and the country take to the stage to receive their awards. Minister of Foreign Affairs, National Security, Legal Affairs and Information, Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzales, congratulated the recipients and encouraged all in attendance to continue to be supportive of the police as they endeavor to make St. Vincent a safe place to live. I first want to congratulate the Royal St. Vincent and Grenadines Police Force in collaboration with the Welfare Association on the annual awards and retirement dinner. I'd have liked to be able to spend the whole time here with this remarkable organization, which has done so much for the safety and security of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I want to thank you very much for your discipline and for your courage and for your hard work. I know there are some ones who will, someone here and there will say, well, not every one of us is disciplined, not every one of us work, would be working hard, but I'm not going there. I'm just, I think it is a fact that the Royal St. Vincent and the Grandees Police Force is a very good police organization and is doing very good work for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I think we are seeing improvements all the time. And I don't need to detail these tonight because you know so. I want to convey to you my own personal commitment to the police force, my own solidarity with you. I believe that I'm probably the only member of parliament who is a member of your credit union. I'm, I'm a fully paid up member and I pay every month my dues into the credit union because I, I, it's one way in which I can show in a practical way solidarity. I haven't yet borrowed any money from it. I don't intend to borrow any money from it, but just in case that I don't have any money to pay for my funeral, Eloise can go and get the funeral benefit, plus what I have there at the credit union. So at least it will take care of a decent burial. Police has shown itself, police force has shown itself to be very disciplined. They have done magnificently well at the time of COVID. And I believe that if the worst happens, we can rely on a number of individuals and organizations, including the men and women of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force. I have absolutely no doubt about that. This has been a very challenging year. But we have come through the year pretty well. And part of it is being just calm and focused and not getting flustered. As you know, I'm not a lamentations man. I have never been. I come to greet you and to thank you and I want to congratulate all those who have been nominated for awards and who are receiving awards here tonight. It must be a very special feeling. From the bottom of my heart, I sincerely thank you. 
Commissioner of Police Colin John noted that the celebration cemented in his mind just how proud he is of every officer, member of police staff, volunteer and members of the public who stepped onto that stage. The theme of this evening's event is a catalyst to success is hard work, discipline and dedication. Hard work is very important. As you will often hear the old adage, hard work brings success. It is not just a cliche. As one of the courses that I went on, the team was, you fight how you train, and you train how you fight. So it's about hard work, it's about practicing, it's about making sure that you do better tomorrow than you did today. And the Royal St. Vincent and Grenadines Police Force, we have some very hard-working police officers. This was ex exemplified this year especially, where we were given additional tasks. We were called upon to enforce the COVID protocol. That was something that hitherto was not there. So we had to work along with the health authorities, we had to work along with immigration and other bodies to ensure that persons are safe and that persons who should be in quarantine stayed in quarantine. We had to ensure that whenever we go out to do our duties, we did it so that we were not ourselves victims of the COVID virus. It was, it was and it is still uncharted territory and my officers, they rose to the occasion and they did a very good job as regard enforcing the COVID protocol. <laughs> this year was also an election year and we know how elections are, very competitive. And I want to thank the members of the public for generally having a peaceful election. But the police, we played our part as well. Once we identified any issues or we picked up any intelligence that there is something that is likely to happen, we tried to be as, tried to be as proactive as possible to ensure that things did not get out of hand. We consulted with the relevant authorities, um, both political parties. We consulted with the monitoring me mechanism or the organization that monitors general election. And this assisted us to ensure that election 2020 was generally violence free and free and fair based on the reports from all of the bodies, well, most of the bodies who, um, who monitored it. We also had our additional duties. We were able, through that, to reduce crime from in at this date, 2019, we had 5,260 crimes to, in total. This year, we have 4,900 and 39, a decrease of 6%. I just want to thank the members of the Royal St. Vincent and Grandis Police Force for their hard work in that regard. And it is cause to celebrate, and I just want to thank everyone for being here once again, and to commend the persons who were judged worthy of, achieve, of receiving awards tonight. Continue to work hard, continue to represent the organization well. Thank you and God bless you. The range of awards presented included most outstanding officer at every police station, police woman and man of the year, awards of excellence, outstanding awards for sports, recognition for members of the public and excellence in partnership. The ceremony was overseen by Master of Ceremonies Hawkins Nanton and the evening also saw a musical presentation from the police force band. 
Reporting for Ion Government, I am Yinka Goodluck. Coming up, a foot care practitioner shared some tips with diabetics which will help them to avoid amputation. The following is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Oh, new snacks on the market. I show my children love this. Yeah. Really? New snacks? Very eye-catching. Look at the amount of sodium or salt in this. I would buy this for my dad. And I bought this too. I never know the pack with so much sodium. Choose snacks that are less than 140 milligrams of sodium per serving. Less salt, healthier life. A message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Welcome back. Diabetes is a disease which can create a host of health-related issues. One body part which the disease has a tremendous effect on is the feet which in many cases has to be amputated. Foot care practitioner Janice Oliver Crease shared how diabetes affects one's feet and what a diabetic can do to care for this important limb. Welcome to our program, Diabetes Prevention and Control. I am Shadi Seeley and today we have Foot Health Practitioner, Sister Janice oliver Cree. Thank you, Ms. Shadi Seeley, for having me on your program this afternoon. Okay, so we know that diabetes affects the feet, so would you tell us how it, it affects the feet? Diabetes is not just affecting the feet just like that. It goes way back, controlling your blood glucose levels. And if your blood glucose levels goes unnoticed, you're not paying attention, you're not checking it, you're not following it up, then it will not only affect your feet, but it will affect other organs in your body. But as we're going to zoom in on the feet this afternoon, diabetes in patients, they are commonly suffering with feet problem. And you look at problems like circulation problem, you look at infection, and subsequently foot-related problems. Not just controlling your blood glucose level, but also taking care of your feet will go a long way to treat and reduce the occurrence of complication in diabetes. So it's very important that you really control your blood glucose level to start with. Okay. So how would you assess the feet of a patient with diabetes? Okay, the feet of a patient, they, they come to you at the, the health center and uh, they normally do the glucose testing and also they do their blood pressure checking. So you will take the patient, make them comfortable. You can either use a bed or you can use a chair and you look at the feet. So you look with your eyes and you observe. And then from the time you observe, you start to ask questions because you may see that the foot look discolored which is blackish in color. You may see that it look reddish. You may see that it look dry. And you can look at it and you may pick up that you're seeing like corns and colors. And these are the things that will lead up to having a wound on your feet. Okay. What you listed, those would be signs of diabetes. Yes, you're problem. seeing signs just producing now that the feet can break down at any time because they have post circulation. Mm -hmm. And this will show up like the discoloration, dark color, the area there is hard, 
when you touch it is very hard sometimes it feel warm and then you start to question them are you inspecting your feet daily because they're supposed to be a part of the care self-care not only leaving it up for the nurses or the doctors they themselves are supposed to check the feet every day what is proper diabetic foot care okay when we look at proper diabetic foot care is that each day the persons who is living with diabetes they are to inspect the feet every day now when you feel like not when you remember it's supposed to become part of you just like how you're brushing your teeth and you know you have to brush your teeth or you need to have a bath every day you check your feet because this is where you're going to pick up all the signs and symptoms so you look at your feet you look between your web space between the toes because you're going to look for any crack okay they call them cracks we call them fissures and if you notice that there is any breakdown you don't stay at home with it so you inspect then you wash your feet with room temperature water mild soap and you pat dry them pat dry your feet between the toes and after that you could get a lotion because diabetic um, have like dry skin and this is because of the diabetes already um, affect the sebaceous gland that is producing the oil so the skin become very dry and scaly so now you have to now add back some oil to keep the skin soft because anyhow it becomes dry and brittle possibility that you can get scratch it could be self-inflicted while you're drying it can bruise and that is a, a way for um, a wound you don't want a wound because with diabetics having wound is very difficult to heal it's slow healing because the less blood coming to the surface so you look at that you also look at if they have any blisters any blisters they will stay at home and boss it and do your own thing you find the health center right away now you have your toenails you don't have somebody who don't know how to cut nails to cut your nails for you because your toenails are supposed to cut straight across now, if somebody who doesn't know how to cut nails and cut your nails and they nip you and doesn't say anything to you, you can lose your toe. From the toe, you can lose all your toe and then you can lose a leg. So you have to be very careful. Then you look at shoe. All these comes into um, foot examination. You look at the very shoe that the person is wearing when they come to the health center. And then if you think the shoe is appropriate, you say it's appropriate. If you think it's not appropriate, you tell them this shoe is not appropriate because it can add injury to your foot and it can also add that it's not a supported shoe for your feet. Very important. Okay, so um, can you tell us some other signs and symptoms of diabetic foot problems? Okay, when we look at the diabetic foot problems, mm -hmm. most persons that comes they come with a nail puncture. And it, when you get a nail puncture, that's most of what I've seen, nail puncture. They come with a nail puncture, and you know when the nail comes out, close back. And you may take that all is well. You may place on some antibiotic and then you go about your happy jolly way. But a week or two after you notice your foot start to swell, look reddish, yellowish, and pain. This is the early stage then when you come now to see the physician after being with them been treated with the antibiotic don't think about tetanostoxa because the tetanostoxa cannot do anything at that point in time okay. it is for future but you have to keep monitoring and observe the foot that if you pick up any slight thing don't wait because the longer you wait you're looking for an amputation okay so most persons associate amputation with diabetes can you tell us more about that okay our amputation with the diabetics is our last resort. They comes in and we try as much to salvage the foot. We don't just go and amputate because we do our assessment, we do our debridement of whatever wound they comes in with and then if at the last moment that we see that we cannot salvage then we do our amputation. So we do amputation like when we first remove a toe. All right. After removing the toe, we will monitor. And then if we see that the healing process is not what we expect it to do, to be, 
then you will maybe take the toes the rest of the toes but sometimes the the patient say doc i don't want more than one cutting so make up your mind and do what you want to do so we don't just run and just cut our foot the foot is from the ankle to the toes okay below the knee to the ankle is your leg so it all depends on the severity of the wound whether if it's gangrenous that we know we cannot save the foot but at least it could still have some quality life if that's how our amputation is being rated it's not just one time you go and cut you go from a toe if the toe doesn't look promising you might need to take all the toes you call that chance metatarsal amputation and then when you leave from that and you go below the knee you call that below knee amputation you go above the knee you call that above amputation so you have digits mm -hmm. we remove digits and then we do chance metatarsal we do above and below knee amputation just to give the individual some quality life still okay so we assess to see where we are feeling the pulse in the foot there are pulse you have the tibial pulse you have the popliteal pulse you have the um, pedial pulse all right so it all depends if you're checking in the foot which is from the ankle to the toes you're looking for these pulses the pedial pulse and the tibial pulse and if you cannot feel them then there's no sense that you leave on the foot because it, it will rot now if you go above the foot now which is below the knee there and you're not feeling the popliteal pulse this is the one just behind the knee there you cannot leave the leg on we're in trouble still so now you have the femoral pulse which is the big pulse up in the hip up there the groin area and that is a powerful pulse so we more or less depend on that pulse to heal an above knee amputation so that above knee amputation will take you all here so it all depends on the pulse and other factors okay if if a person loses their toes what are some ways that you you will tell them in aid to prevent them from losing more or an entire leg okay so we go right back at controlling your blood glucose level very important and again i stress that you know persons need to have a, a blood glucose machine they need it because it's like you just doing things at random you don't know what your level is but doctor may tell you oh you're on morning and even insulin and some of them may go along and do it take it as it is some may say well no i don't feel good when i take this amount and it drop in my sugar so it is very important that they get a machine so that they can check it at home it is self-care you need to be into your care so controlling your blood glucose level is key then you have to do your foot assessment foot inspection if you can do it then you have a family member to do it for you because diabetes affect eyes too and if you have blood vision and you cannot see then you have to depend on a family member or a caregiver to inspect your feet for you so you need to do foot inspection because you already lose a toe and when you bathe or you wash your foot you have to follow all the guidelines like you dry between the toes you inspect to see if you have any cuts or bruise and then if you have this thing you don't delay you don't stay at home and say i didn't take it for anything this is not time to say do not take it for anything because diabetes already affect your immune system when you get a cut it's gonna take longer to heal than somebody who doesn't have diabetes and then now you have to look for the right shoe to accommodate that foot that doesn't have um, the great toe or the fifth toe or how many toes you must have the shoe 
So now you have to tell yourself, I must take care of my feet. I cannot go bare feet inside and outside of the house. I cannot wear tight shoes. I cannot wear a socks that is not being washed daily. I need to change my socks because all of these ads to preventing you from having a wound or losing your entire foot. So these are what people need to really take serious look at as, as a diabetic with the other components because we have other components. But we, have, we are looking now at the foot. The foot entails shoes, socks, you know, how do I wash it? How do I dry it? How do I, you know, add lotion to it? I'm not supposed to put any lotion between my toes because I want to know if anything is between my toes. I can easily identify it and do not stay at home and say, okay, man, this go heal up, man. Men especially don't like to go to doctors. So I'm, I'm sending a word of caution. As a diabetic, they need to play integral role into their health. Some of them are mechanics. Some of them are construction workers. Are they wearing appropriate shoe on their job? They mingle in oil. And diabetes not only affect the foot, they could affect the hands too. Because if you're not feeling, the blood glucose sugar is out of control. You're not feeling and your hands are dirty, your feet are dirty and you get a bruise. You don't know how long you get that bruise. And you're looking up in the sky to come up with an answer. It will have been well gone over time when you get that um, injury. Now you come, it's a hard task because you have to lie down on bed rest, more or less. You can't put the foot on the ground. So going back, it must be blood glucose control. What are the risk factors for the development of diabetic foot ulcer? Risk factors for the diabetic foot ulcers all persons or people with diabetes are at risk for foot ulcers, which can have multiple causes. Some factors can increase the risk of foot ulcers, including poorly fitted shoes. Because if it doesn't have the correct shoe, you will develop all um, calluses under the sole of your foot. You have poor hygiene. I keep saying to inspect your foot wash your foot daily, dry them properly, especially between the toe space. Improper trimming of toenails. So if you're not trimming your toenails straight across and you're, you're coughing, then you end up with ingrowing toenail that, that too can lead to foot ulcer. Alcohol consumptions. So the persons who love alcohol, if they can avoid it at all costs, it's better. All right. You have eye disease. Again, from diabetes, because I mean, if you cannot see, you can bump the foot into anything and you have injury to your, your feet. You also look at obesity. Obesity, when people are overweight, they too can end up with ulcers. Because if you're obese, you tend to just sit down one place. Sitting down one place, you end up with circulation problem. Your blood glucose level is high it's not controlled, then you lose sensation in your feet, things stuck you and you don't know. When you do find out, it is late. So that too can lead to um, foot ulcer. Tobacco use, those persons who smoke, it also decrease. Oxygen level going down to your blood, a lot of smoke. So more your blood is more carbon mm -hmm. than oxygenated. And then if you have that kind of blood going down to your, your foot, and you have a wound, you could imagine no healing is going to take place. And sad to say that most persons, you know, they have these wounds on the pants and it's sort of at heat. Healing can't take place. So you need to be exposed. You need to, if possible, cut out the tobacco smoking. But I know that don't happen. They tell you, yes, nurse, I stopped smoke two months ago. You will end up with an amputation for sure. They're going to end up with an amputation because of poor circulation. They're not going to feel, and there's nothing we can do. You yeah, could do revascularization, but we don't do it here. Or you can take an artery from the unaffected leg and bring it over to the affected, but we don't do it here. So most of them end up with an amputation. So these are some of the respected.
What are some treatments of diabetic foot also? Okay, from my uh, perspective, mm -hmm. the person already have a uh, diabetic foot also. Okay. It is for them to comply. When you come to see the specialist nurse, mm -hmm. uh, the doctor who deals with these kinds of wounds, is for them to comply and carry out the instruction. If you are told to rest the foot, do not walk up and down on the foot, you carry out these instructions because when you on your feet 24-7, you're traumatizing the womb. So healing is for the delay. That is why we are saying to persons that you rest. But we know that some of them don't rest. We also tell them not to wet the womb when you bathe it. Don't wet that foot at all. You have to come up with devices how you are going to have your shower, but do not wet our womb. Because this is where you, the wetness can hug bacteria. And we're trying to keep off bacteria. So from our perspective, we do wound changes, like the dressing changes, like every other day. Go to your health center and you get your womb. If they see things are not going the way that it's supposed to, to do, you see a district doctor. And if they need to refer them back to see the foot specialist or the vascular surgeon, then they do that. But the onus is on the patient too, the relative. Because if you have a foot, you need help. And if they're not getting any help, they're going to go on the foot and do as they feel like. So we advise that they rest the foot, elevate the foot, keep off the foot as much as possible, and do not get it wet when you're being. Don't force it in the shoe to go nowhere because that is going to make matters worse. And all of these things, we pick them up as soon as you come back to see us. We know if you've been doing a good job from if you're not doing anything. So if you comply with these things, along with controlling your blood glucose level, which is your diet, which is not in my um, spare, then things can go well for you in helping the womb to heal. Along with, you know, you might need some antibiotic. If you have, you know, it's infected, you need some antibiotic and so on. If you comply, you're on your way. Okay. Just mean you will be off of your job, you know, and that is another error because you're off of your job for a long time. Sometimes you end up medical board in you. So that is why we are saying diabetics should take care of themselves. Take care of yourself, love yourself. Nobody will not love yourself. When you leave yourself and unkept for, then you pay the consequence and you will not be able to deal with that. So we are saying take care of your health. It's a shared responsibility. Tourism has many benefits to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It creates growth and a boost in economic activities, infrastructure development, job creation, entrepreneurship, and is a source of foreign exchange earnings. Supermarkets and vendors, bars, restaurants, taxis, tour guides, hotels, service providers, and many more all benefit directly from income gained through the tourism industry. Taxes collected from visitors to our country help St. Vincent's economy and its growth. Tourism is everyone's business. Live it, love it, embrace it. Tourism is everyone's business. Yeah. Live it, love it, embrace it. Welcome back. This year, Las Ufra is undergoing an effusive eruption after 41 years of being quiet. This evening, we take a historical look at the Las Ufra and its impact on local communities. So I'm standing here, essentially in the village of Fancy, located on the northern, northeastern side of the, of the, of the volcano, Sufre volcano. And Fancy is actually an interesting place because it sits upon sort of the larger superstructure that makes up Sufre. You see, it's, it's a little bit protected from the direct effects of the volcano, but it's unique in the fact that you certainly can have blocks get into the village, which is just behind me. 
um, fragments of rock that could cause harm to people, and you certainly would have a lot of ash. And when the eruption plumes and the eruptions get bigger, you could have pyroclastic flows and surges get into the fancy. So, and the, the other thing about fancy is that there, it's, it's a very rugged coastline, it's very rough seas, so getting out of fancy by, by sea is quite difficult. So it, it may be one of the places where initially during an explosive eruption of the kind of scale of 1902 or 1979, you may not be directly affected, but if you stay here for too long, you will be cut off and not be able to get to safe ground and then things may get very, very difficult and more explosive and then you, you, you're in a, a place where you could actually be, be harmed. So getting people, people out of fancy very early during the eruption, both because they're so far from, from, from any place that is safe and also because it's difficult to get them out, is, is critical in terms of saving lives. Um, so it's a lovely village, but it sits on the flank of the volcano and you need to get people out as quickly as possible earlier on in an eruption. Flat land is usually difficult to find in volcanic areas such as the Eastern Caribbean, where these islands are built up from explosive volcanism and activity associated with it. One of the areas in which you tend to find flat land is associated with pyroclastic flow deposits, pyroclastic fans. These are deposits that were produced by pyroclastic flows or surges, which are these very dangerous, hot concentrations of gas, um, of various fragments of rock that move down the mountainside quite rapidly during explosive eruptions and are very dangerous. And these are areas which then generate nice, gently sloping land and essentially flat land where people occupy and live. I'm standing here in the community of New Orange Hill, which is built on paraclastic flow deposits. Past eruptions of the Sufre volcano, historic, perhaps prehistoric eruptions, created paraclastic flows which have built up the deposits, this fan upon which the community is built. The community is located between the Warabishi River and the Rabaka Dry River. These are two river valleys that we'd expect future eruptions of Soufraie to, to be inundated by paraclastic flows. In other words, this is an area that in future, in future eruptions would, could be potentially impacted. And this is an area where you would have to move people out of, evacuate them out of, before the eruption starts. In 1902, prior to the eruption, this, this, this area here, which is now jungle and buried, you could still see some of the ruins around, was once uh, the center of a thriving um, community where you had sugar plantation around and uh, it was sugar, sugar cultivation was one of the mainstay at the time of the island. In 1902, the eruption happened and it essentially produced pyroclastic density currents that came down the Wallabo River and the lower end of them got to this um, sugar mill uh, burnt it, destroyed everything, and since then it's essentially been taken over by the jungle. Now these areas are important because they show us not only the impact of the volcano, because now of course what you had as a thriving part of the economy has now changed and hasn't been recovered, but also they're important because the deposits that were, that are essentially trapped by this, this ruin are areas that people who studied the volcano would come to to understand better the eruptions that happened in the past. So one of the things that we would do when we come here is look for, for layers of deposits, deposits that could tell us something about how the 1902 eruption has evolved. And there are actually areas where it seems that some of the 1902 deposits are still preserved. The question that we have perhaps in, in looking at a site like this is whether or not it has actually been disturbed or not. Because what we are trying to do is to find areas where the deposits hasn't been disturbed in any way. And what that helps us to do is, is determine how the events evolved from um, that day when the 1902 eruption first started, which explosions created what kind of deposit. We really need to find places where it's well preserved and this is potentially one of the areas that you could have that still exists, um, certainly in terms of 1902. So 1902 in the scale of Soufre is perhaps not one of the biggest eruptions, but it's certainly one of the most significant ones in historical times. Um, it means that if we have one of these kinds of eruptions in the future, areas like this where I'm standing would certainly be inundated by paraclastic flows. It would be places that people certainly would have to be evacuated from 
you'd have a lot of ash. It would be an area where the vegetation would be killed, um, where there would be a lot of destruction. But it also means that if you have something that is a little bigger than that, the impact is going to of, of that it had, 1902 had here, would then potentially reach further afield. Coming up, vector control inspectors on the hunt for mosquitoes in the natural environment. South Coast Marine and Coastal Rehabilitation Adaptation Project. Located south of the island, extending to over five bays, White Sands, Kanash, Kaliakwa, Villa, and Indian Bay. Let's improve aquatic life. A message from the National Parks, Rivers, and Beaches Authority and partners. Welcome back. You're watching the API's Iron Government Program. Most Vincentians, when they hear the term Vector Control Inspector, Thoughts of an official who would check the surroundings of one's homes or breeding sites come to mind. However, the important personnel also have to deal with mosquitoes which exist in the natural environment. Swamps are wet areas which support unique ecosystems which facilitates life for a range of aquatic and terrestrial life. One well-known swamp is located at Kanash, which is home to several mangrove and mangrove associated trees, which help to maintain water quality and protect against surges. However, swamps can also be a breeding ground for mosquitoes, which can be harmful to human life. On hand at the Canal Swamp was Vector Control Inspector Ronald Lynch, who said swampy areas can support a wide variety of life, including many species of mosquitoes. The chemical that we use, it's a, it's a biological. There is a difference between biological and chemical. A biological now can um, break down in the environment without affecting the non-target organism that the chemical is um, that the chemical would basically um, negate so with the biological now the biological would um, focus more on the mosquito larvae and the mosquito it won't affect any non-target organisms that the um, that 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 is not the, the the mosquito basically but with the chemical now the chemical affects every single thing in the environment so you have to be cautious of what you're using based on um, the ecology of where you're using the treatment. So for an area like this now, you would um, basically use the biological because as you can see, there, there are boards flying around. There is, there's a large ecosystem here that supports other forms of, of, of aquatic life, which includes um, frogs, fishes, sometimes come get washed up and they survive in that area. So we have to be conscious of what we do most of the time. So the, the use of chemicals, we try to restrict the use of chemicals in areas like this as much as we can. Um, sometimes we introduce um, fishes to the little streams and the little waterways because fishes um, are the natural predator for mosquito larvae and certain stages of the mosquito. And um, it's not just any and any fish, we have to have a specific type of fish that can survive in an area like this. In some instances, the presence of mosquitoes can be plainly seen by inspectors. However, this is not always the case. Lynch highlighted some of the tools used to detect the presence of mosquitoes in swampy areas. With the dipper now, because you can't just go and just look at the water and visually inspect it with your eye. You have to get close and personal, so we use the dippers now. The dippers take samples from different areas along the waterway and then whenever we find breedings, the field microscope now would basically help us to identify what we have in this area. And with the technology now, we can basically map what areas you would find um, that genus of mosquito basically because an ecosystem like this could support at least three different genus of, of the mosquitoes. So we work with the field microscope to do, um, basically just identify it, log it on the map and then pinpoint what areas now based on what is going on with ecology so that we're going to know, okay, that particular type of mosquitoes likes, mosquito likes to breed in that particular area based on the fact that that is more shaded it has more um, foliage, a lot of um, dead material is, is helping to provide food in that particular area. As two voices where you might have salt water coming up on the beach, a particular mosquito might prefer 
that area with the salt water keeps washing over so they're going to get accustomed to the salt water and therefore you would have them breeding in that particular area. An area like this now where there's a lot of crab holes you don't know how far down the crab holes go some of them might be connected you would somebody would have to come and, and, and basically do a full check of this area what we do most of the time is just come do a spot check make sure it's not breeding mosquitoes too heavily treat as much as we could treat given um, the amount of crab holes that are here so yeah basically um, that covers it most of, the, uh, most of what we do in this area that basically covers it Speaking during a repeat visit of the swamp yesterday, Public Health Officer Ralph Williams reinforced the importance of not using chemicals which damage the environment and highlighted how the BTI chemical kills mosquito larvae. Um, the surveillance include we use a dipper, which I have in my hand, we use a dipper and we scoop and look at it to see what species and if it's actually breeding. Once we determine that it is breeding, then we proceed to treat it with a chemical, BTI. And a chemical is a, a, biological, a biological treatment that we are presently using. And let's just say on a wholesale. Before we used to be using like Cetemifos, but now we're using a more biological. Because in these areas, some of the habitats that we go in, like streams and swamps, as I told you before, they will have a lot of microorganisms, well, life form, other living organisms in it. And we, we don't want to offset the ecosystem. So what we do, we work with the ecosystem. So we look at it, we use a biological agent to, to treat it. And if, if we do a treatment and we make a next check a recheck and we notice that it's still breathing. It breathing over and over after a time. We'll look to do a more permanent permanent thing in that we may introduce like larvivorous fish. Well the, the, the BTI um, which I see is the Bacillus terengenesis is really there's a strain of the the biological um, agent well the bio, biological agent um, it it the lava consume it and it interfere with with the the mid gut Mr. Lynch it interfere with the mid gut and cause a, a swelling and boss accompanying Williams at the swamp was vector control inspector Ronald Lynch who highlighted some of the technology used to trap mosquitoes in the swampy areas as well as one solution to a continuous problem in the area because as Mr. Williams is explaining, the BTI is a biological. So for them to um, actually, for that biological to actually work, they have to ingest it. But with the Temophos now, the Temophos is a chemical. So it has a certain... Um, yeah, so what happens most of the time, whenever you treat the hole with it, even if it's an adult mosquito, because it's a chemical, it gives off a certain fume to it. So it sometimes attacks the adult mosquitoes. But the, 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 the danger of that is... When you expose personnel to the Temophos, it has certain side effects after long-term use. So that's where we kind of got rid of the, um, the Temophos in the long run. So that's where we bring out the field microscope now. So whenever we come and we do um, work like this, we bring out something called an aspirator. So what the aspirator basically is, is just a vacuum that sucks up adult mosquitoes inside of it. We take them back to the lab, put them in cold storage so they die, and then we inspect them to see what type of species are... Um, inhabiting the crab hole specifically. So that way now you will realize that um, this particular ecosystem could support um, multiple subspecies of mosquitoes all at once. And you had to inspect each and every hole itself? Yeah, you had to inspect. Well, for most of the, most of the time, we might, it might take us about two or three days to do this particular area. If we decide to do an intensive surveillance for this area here, but if we're just doing a pass to we we'll just check the major waterways and the major areas of water pooling up and for the crab holes now we might check inspect one in five or uh, one in ten and you know just basically walk trying to check if you're not seeing any adult mosquitoes emerging from the crab hole then you pass over it and go on to the one that you see um, basically mosquitoes adult mosquitoes are emerging from is there anything we can do to help to destroy this site while not damaging the ecosystem um, 
for me, the most effective um, method is um, not importing but using what is there naturally on site. Um, as you could see, the, the crabs dig um, their holes and leave embankments. We could use that same principle. Just use the same dot that is here and fill it in. Um, there are some fallen tree logs. We bring in a, a, a machine that could mulch, break this down to mulch. We fill it in with the mulch. The beach is a recreational area. People come, they leave plastic bottles, glass bottles, and a lot of stuff. Um, so basically just use what is there naturally to fill it in. Um, people might come and have a little cook, they might use the logs, they might burn it to take that and just straight back into the hole. And this would, over time, it would just fill in itself. And that's it for the APIs and government. Thanks for viewing. If you have missed any of our past programs, you can catch these on our Facebook or YouTube pages at API, the Agency for Public Information, St. Vincent and the Grandines, or our website, www.api.com.vc. And once again, we at the Agency for Public Information wish everyone a healthy, prosperous, productive and safe 2021. I am Bavin Oliver.